Chair, for some of you, we're having a uh, discussion uh, at the Capitol about health care and uh, what it's actually costing the state. Uh, we uh, needed to look at some sort of like a managed health care uh, versus the uh, pay for services. A lot of folks don't even like to have those discussions, but uh, we've had a little bit of that. But uh, anyway, I uh, called down here and had uh, Dee Renshaw from the local hospital drive to the Capitol during all the ice and sat down for an afternoon and he understands the language that's going on and how it would impact Henrietta and then wrote me a summary of that when it's over with. And so uh, I tell you what, the community participation uh, out of Henrietta is just uh, beyond belief. And I just want you guys to know that about Dee and it's a great thing. Looking forward to being here, looking forward to fielding your questions here today. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's always a great time to come to here, Eddie. You all have been uh, very vocal with me about things that you're looking for and expecting, and, 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 I'm, and I'm always glad to come here and fill you in on what's going on. Um, uh, as you know, session started. We just finished uh, week three, which was deadline week, and uh, that means that we had to have all of our bills out of committee that could potentially be heard on the floor this week. I, I had, I believe, six bills that passed out of committee. Um, yesterday, though, I, I passed a House Joint Resolution out of the Rules Committee that would, uh, you know, after hundreds of conversations with, you know, constituents and Oklahomans, um, the common question I get asked is, what are we going to do about State Question 640? So I ran a House Joint Resolution to take uh, State Question 640 from a 75% uh, threshold to a two-thirds majority vote of the House and Senate. It's, it's not a huge jump, but it is, it is a little bit different. We did pass that out of committee yesterday, so I'm looking forward to hearing that on the floor. Basically, if we get it all the way through to signed by the governor, it would actually come to you for a vote uh, probably next November. So look forward to your questions and enjoy the fellowship. Guys, I hate this trend of standing up. It's I'll stand center. up the first time and set the question, but I'll just echo what uh, my colleagues have said for uh, getting the process rolling. For you know, it's, it's a unique session because the pressure of, of running a concurrent session and a regular session uh, has created a, a completely different dynamic at the Capitol. So it's uh, it's been a little different uh, atmosphere over there, but things are rolling along and. and I sat there and talked about a lot of things for quite a while. I did this morning way too much. I'm going to open it up and let y'all just ask questions and maybe get your uh, concerns answered. Anybody have questions? Yeah. Uh, the the vocal on the 640, what does it change the ratio to? So it would, it would, it would basically be a 66 at, uh, in the house. It would be 66 instead of 70. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's be 68. I'm thinking of my original. I originally was running it at a 60 percent vote. So from so 70 to 60, 60, 60. Well, it's the same. It's the same vote running it was eight. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 60, 68. Okay. Yeah. Two weeks ago, I went to Texas to buy a bull, and I got stuck like five miles over the state, not having plates on my truck. Okay, in Texas, uh, we don't have no global, we don't have plates on our truck. But you know, God, this has been years and years and years, and if we need money, uh, look, just look, even if you don't do the rancher uh, tag, look at the flat bed trailer, look at the boats that sold in this state, look how much money could be just ear tag uh, for the teachers' raises or whatever you got needed for it. Because every other state around us have it. And we're wasting money that could go to something good uh, if we just, you know, title them one time. Not different plates every year, but at least title them one time and get that shot. The, tra the trailers that are here will be grandfathered in, and all the new ones that come in will have to have plates. It's something to think about. Now, I know the senior ranchers are all going to rile up and that sort of thing, but 
it's not that much money. On the RTVs, when we sell them now, uh, people don't even, that $32 means nothing to them. I mean, because they know it's going to the state to, do, to be used for something for the roads and bridges or something like that. Just have to be explained to them. Though. I know that there were, there were conversations in the House last year about potentially having the tag trailers. I, I think it would be a real struggle to grandfather such a large group in. You just leave it alone. Just from the time you started a date, January 1st, 2019, from now on you need plates on your train. It's been conversation. We have a bill in finance and uh, failed. Uh, exactly what you're talking about. It was about a, uh, a $25 over three years uh, to go on there. Uh, one of the most powerful lobbies that's up there is Farm Bureau. And, uh, okay, I'm a Farm Bureau member, yeah. but. And uh, so I think the Farm Bureau will begin to push that. I'm not saying to push back against it this time. Uh, but with the real legislators, it's just been kind of no go to this point. Uh, voted for it myself, uh, but uh, we need to do it, not just for the revenue. I've had people call me about stolen trailers, those exactly. types of things. Right. Let's put some stuff on there. And we figured, you know, even at $25 for three years, something like that on these trailers, it's not going to hurt a lot of people to be able to do that. And help with the state some, but more than likely, I mean, better than that, we're going to have a trailer of that, that trailer. Exactly. Right. We've got identification of all. Let me ask you a question, though. I was told there that, that you can voluntarily take your trailers now. Yes, you can. Okay. You can go. And, and, and next time I go to Texas, I'll have a plate on it because the officer was very nice, but he told me. Next time you come down here, and if I stop you, said that we might find something else wrong with your trip. Okay, so, so what's yeah. the cost? Exactly. I'm just being honest. I mean, he's what he's saying. You know, you guys got to be hard to like we go to your law. If our, our traders go to Texas, they got flights on. Them. So what's the cost if you do that voluntarily? It's it's based on what the value of your trader is. It's like the car or the truck. So like an excise tax then? Okay, all right, very good. And your traders already come with the titles. You don't get a title. You get the, just like you get your car, and you take it to the title company in order to get a title. I know our police department has been ch chasing a ton of stolen trailers oh, yeah. because they're the easiest thing to steal because there is no tracking. Right. <clears throat> the going out of state also uh, is an issue. Uh, we used to hold a number of voices from here to California. And without having a license plate on the trailer, they created a problem. So we went ahead and got a license plate to be at home to take care of that issue. Uh, there was a bill that came out of committee. Oh, this week that dealt with the developmentally disabled list of folks trying to supplement the, uh, the revenue where they can get matching federal funds to help with that list. It's gotten where they're on that list for over 10 years now where they get any help. And this was a list of others that have. And I, I found out that municipalities and counties can now, for RTVs and ATVs, they go over. 35 miles an hour, you can, you can elect to sell a tag every year uh, to raise additional revenue. And I, I think she said it could raise up to $3 million a year. You can't put tags on your RTVs right now, but you got to have turn signals on, they can run over 25. You have to run over 20. She said 35. So. And they have to but that's an optional issue. It's not a mandatory issue, correct? That's correct. Yes. And we have looked at making them legal in Henrietta, but we can't cross the 75. We can't get on the highway. Oh, no, you cannot get on the highway at all. You would have to build an overpass to go across Maine. Because we get asked all the time why we haven't done that, and that's why. We can't. Other questions? It's a goal reversal. Old Morgan was loud today. And, you know. So now y'all are all running down from that? Yeah, you guys are just getting started. Yes, sir. Not to start it today, but just curious, knowing that there's some legislation going over there in Oklahoma City, as, what is the position about teachers carrying guns or being allowed guns in the schools? Yeah, so, so currently, currently teachers in Oklahoma can carry a, a weapon. They have to have some training. And there's in statute, there's some training requirements and different things. And it's up to the local school board. Uh, there was a house bill that came through this week that uh, would 
give the local school board the ability to relax those regulations, I guess you might say. Um, and, you know, so currently we have schools in the state where teachers are carrying weapons and they have a sign posted out from them. Um, I had a superintendent um, from Bags, not part of the Bags School District, but she told me that she's going to get her to sell carry and, and some of our teachers are already carrying as well. Um, so, so there, you know, in my opinion, that's a that's an issue that needs to be opened up for a broader conversation with the with the entire house, so that everybody in Oklahoma has representation in that. So I supported it in committee so that we could have a broader conversation. But I know it's a big concern. Um, to me, uh, if you're if you're an educator and you don't want to carry, then we should surely shouldn't be forcing you to carry. Um, but if you're an educator and that you you uh, have training and have your concealed carry, uh, and, and your school board allows it, I, I don't see any problem with it from my perspective. But, uh, you know, it'll be a broader conversation that should be happening in the House at least, you know, over the next couple of months. We've not discussed it in the Senate. Um, uh, we'll probably have it. If it out of the House, we'll have to deal with them. I, I'm very interested in what, in what you think on this firearms. Uh, because there's bills that's going to come up that's all over the place. And uh, there's one that's called, you know, constitutional carry, especially if you go down to Walmart somewhere and buy a gun, they're going to run you through dicks, and uh, that's going to be it. Uh, Senator Langford and I were on Flashpoint together. He was even talking about his bill, Fix Nicks, because not everything's being fed into that. And so my question to you is, are you interested in having legislation in Oklahoma that basically you just go to Walmart, buy a gun, run you through nicks, and you're good? No mental health ground, background checks, anything like that. Anyone interested in here just have totally unregulated carry or constitutional carry? No one. The yeah, talk is also about kind of reducing the license fee uh, in the Senate on uh, concealed carry. Right now it's $100. And uh, we had a bill uh, that uh, we were able to stop and because we were going to reduce that down to $25 just simply to have the background checks and be able to do it. I was against that bill uh, based on the reason of business. And uh, right now, OSBI does background checks, the federal government does the background checks, and so we have an estimated cost in that as far as the state is concerned of about $80. I mean, that, that's the cost to the taxpayers for the background checks, the fingerprints, and all those type of things. And uh, so we, like, we have about $20 in there that we fund some more parts of the employees that are involved, the, the equipment's involved. So it's not a money maker for the state of Oklahoma to begin with. And so my, my vote on that and my conversation on that was, if you're in business and you're buying things for $80 or $100 and you're selling them for $25, you're going to be out of business pretty quick. Uh, you cannot do that and be able to do it. So it's not an anti-Second Amendment type thing, but you got the physical end of it. So let's go back to the guns again. We talked about the schools. Are you for arming our teachers? Honestly, I think it's ridiculous. They're paying the 49ers of all the states. And they can't fund them fully, and now we're going to put one more burden on them that bring your weapon if you're not going to be a security guard. And I understand there are people all over the board, but I just, especially right now with teachers and how we're not properly funding, and we all know there's things going on there trying to improve that. I just would be hard pressed to think that's the best solution. I uh, watched a, uh, a film of uh, Glenn Johnson, uh, Higher Education. Mm -hmm. And of course, right now, college presidents, they have the right to approve it or not approve it on college campuses. Uh, it belongs to them. But they took five people, and uh, I think two or three of them were, were veterans of war, uh, gave them paint guns, and put them in the classroom. And they said, in two weeks or within two weeks, we're going to have a live shooting here at the college. You don't know when it's going to be. And so military people carried their guns every day. When it actually took place, one of them shot himself, one shot the teacher, one shot a student next to him, and no one hit the intruder. And my belief is, unless you are there trained for that particular thing, you're going to stop those people who are coming in you can actually become a danger there. Now, should the local school board have that right? I think we can give them that right. I don't, I don't mind giving them that right. 
Uh, but that's a huge liability. Uh, but you know where the teachers' on. minds are. They're in the children. They're not in the children. They're in the children, protecting the children. They're not in protecting nothing else. Yeah. And another issue is the person you may have to shoot may be one of your students mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. it, and, and that's really hard for the teacher <laughs> to look at it like that. You, the, the person you may actually have to shoot may be someone that you know. Right. right. And how about the life? And have the biggest race. concern I Basically have is that's mm -hmm. that's what happened in Florida. You had police officers that didn't even go in the building. These were trained individuals that should have. Now you're talking about individuals who are not trained near the level they were, and you're expecting them to do the job that those gentlemen, or those, I don't know if they're all gentlemen, they might have been the lady involved, but they didn't do that. So you, that's, you're putting a lot of burden on a teacher besides just teaching. I mean, I, and everybody likes to look at the best case scenario. I mean, I, the thing that just drives me crazy is when someone says, well, the only thing to stop a bad man with a gun is a good man with a gun. Well, it's a great if the good man with a gun is at the right place, does a perfect shot, and does something, works out right. But everybody looks at the best case scenario, and you never look at the other things that could happen. So my concern is, uh, I, I think we've got laws already available. OK, Oklahoma has made the national news a number of times for having uh, teachers who are armed there. And we've got laws, I think they have to go through police certification, they have to go through training. So I, I hate to lower the requirements any, any more than that person. Well, yeah, that's one of the problems to deal with the issues. Uh, I think one of the problems that we have is uh, securing our facilities. You know, one of the first things you want to do with any issue is provide security. Security can be provided through access. So you have to explore your access points and how you control that. How do you control a, a teacher a parent conference maybe in a certain number of locations in access? So we always want to jump to other laws and other controls. But I, we have immediate control. Uh, of, our, of, our, of our schools by looking at how we pardon if we need. What's the vulnerability? And I know Henrietta Police Department, in fact, it's on Fox News, they had done a simulation here a few years ago. I don't know how much follow-up has been done on that, but it would be keeping your law enforcement in practice to simulate actual situations. Students being aware of that, but how do you pardon a school teacher is there to teach? If they elect to want to carry a weapon and it's all approved, I, I don't have a problem with that, but they're there to teach. But we need to look at how we harden our facility in any, any facility. Have you gone to the Social Security office lately and try to get in there? There's a guard, there's a locked door. You can't even, you, you can't even access it. It's not comfortable. But we do have to look at our access, how we control that access. And if we uh, need your reactions, emotional legislation, all these things don't do us any good. Sit down and rationally discussing what we can actually do in the existing environment. How can we change that? I think that's something we need to look at. The reality of it is this. In the House and Senate, we have a small group of people who are going to run gun bills every year. They're always going to run gun bills. Right? Um, one of the things I'm working on with some of the superintendents, a couple of superintendents in my district, just to see if we could get it get any traction with it is actually setting up substations within the school. You know, we have schools that have, you know, available classrooms that they the police or the you know the sheriff's department can set up a substation within the school where they go there to do their reports and you know whatever police officers do at the station, potentially they can do that at the school. Now, this was actually brought to me by one of uh, a good friend of mine who's a police chief. As a, as a consideration, I've reached out to a couple of superintendents to see if it's a if it's a viable possibility. It's kind of like quick trip, quick trip, uh, and you'll see this. You know, when we get one out here, if you're a police officer, you go to quick trip and get free drinks anytime. So that way, they always have police cars in their drive. They always have police officers in their station, or you know, getting drinks, and they and just that visual uh, uh, representation there all the time helps keep you know potential crime issues down. 
So that's one of the things I'm working on with some of my superintendents is, you know, how do we get police officers to be at the school so that we have that, you know, that perception that, you know, I may want to think twice before I go in and start trying to shoot up the school. What, what about the school consolidation? Now we're talking about security. Now I'm going to yell at the time to consolidate these schools. Got all these top superintendents out, take this money and pay the teachers, consolidate the schools, put the security in the way it should be, and then go on. Because, you know, I came from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, and here in Oklahoma. And our schools are great. I have nothing. Our, our, our kids got great education in the schools here. But I came from a class of 2,000 kids when I graduated from high school. We had an excellent school that had a lot more things than these kids here when, when, when I came here in 1991. But can you just take a look at the schools that are around here are, are starting to deteriorate. We could consolidate schools, go to one superintendent, and look at the money that we'd save. It might be a little bit more busing, but it'd be a lot more better for the students. It's, that's a, it's a, just a highly political I know. piece that, you know, I mean, you're telling, are you saying consolidate administration or the actual school? I'm talking actual schools consolidate. Yeah. yeah. So the, the problem is. You can is, save money on building, you can save energy, you can save transportation. Well, but the problem, the problem with the building is the school that consolidates, you know, let's say, do it in Henrietta, consolidate, then Henrietta's going to be responsible for that building, so there's still going to be costs associated with that. Well, that building will be, you can sell that building or get rid of that building. Once it's gone, that money's gone. You get a lot more money uh, to take care of students that you'll be able to use a lot more, utilize more of the stuff in the school, having better computers and everything else when you got more kids, because you your, get more money to do that for them. Your rural areas are going to be a tough sell to, um, you know, I've said it before, you know, the most difficult thing to do in, in a community is kill the mascot. We don't want to be a big school. Well, you, you have, yes, Our kids are there because they don't they don't function well in big schools. Uh, a lot of times, we like our small school. I, I, I don't have any kids, but if you're, you're going to consolidate the same money, you're going to have to look at that somewhere down the road. But you know, if you talk a lot, and you can would say that what you do to start first is start funding our schools properly, yeah. and then some of the small schools will have better facilities. But Maybe some consolidation, but a lot of these communities, their whole identity is wrapped around these small schools. Thank you. Well, we also keep talking about hiring officers. We can't keep officers. Do you want to go to work for $29,000 a year and put your life on the line, go in that school where that shooter's at? They make less than teachers, but we're saying we're going to put it all on them. We have two positions at Henrietta Police Department. Joe Prentice has five in Almaghi. They cannot keep them full because nobody wants to do it. Because when you shoot that person, guess what? Now you're the bad guy. You're put on suspension because you shot him. Although you just saved that whole school. Now you're on suspension because you shot him. I would like to involve you money, though. Yeah. And then it's funny how, you know, I always say if you want to know why something happens, just follow the money. You know, see who's, who's saving the money or who are, who's not paying their taxes or whatever. Just follow the money and you'll figure it out. But consolidation, you know, I, I was uh, in committee the other day and I found out an interesting name of Nicole Henry Scholarship that, that uh, has, they're wanting to expand it. And I forgot what, what the amount they want to expand, like $10 million or something. And everybody talks about the administrative cost of public schools. You know, statutorily, it's said public schools can't spend over 5% on administrative costs. But in that scholarship program, whoever handles that program, they get 10 percent of that money for administrative costs. 10 percent. Nobody complains about that. When I asked the author about it, I said, oh, "Don't you think that's a little excessive for 10 percent?" And all they do is a go between. They have, and it's OCPA in Oklahoma City is the only one in the state that does it. They get 10 percent of that transaction. And. I asked you if you didn't think that was a little excessive. And they don't teach any kids anything. All they do is transfer the money around and they get 10%. So, you know, it kind of depends on whose office you get endured on a lot of these things and about who, who gets concerned about it. But I, I still think local control is the key to any of our schools. And it's still optional for these schools to consolidate. And when there's funds set up at the state to, to 
encourage them and finance them for those consolidations. <coughs> and when, when they feel like it's their time to consolidate, I hate to be the one to say the name calls them down because I was a product of a small school. I think a small school is the greatest thing we've ever had in the state, personally. And you take a lot of communities out in Western Oklahoma, not particularly. They want to consolidate some schools, Andy. Let's go to, let's go to Tulsa. Look how many schools you have. Uh, uh, Jeans. I'm not talking about all this. Of I'm talking, I'm talking about Do you this. think those folks would consolidate all their schools into one and have one superintendent? I don't think so. They, they, first thing they want to do is point to the small little schools and say, you shut those schools down because they're inefficient and they need to be consolidated. But don't look at us. So I, I'm still a big local control fan. It's like if people want to support their local schools and they want to vote to have their own taxes, keep their local schools going <coughs> and their local community, I'm all for it. You always say, Roger, that um, you know, the local government should be the government of the people. Well, she have any of her dependents on her? Yeah. She said that it was just for hers. Yeah, the they should be. Should not be. Should not be. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we were at, uh, could it be for life insurance? I don't know she's taking it. She well, said it was health insurance. On a little over 453 and going up for teacher insurance. And it's going up 4% again this next year. What it is is they pay so much of it. She said they only pay they so pay, much. They pay so much of it, depending on what plan. Like the state has a set, we'll pay this much of it. If you pick a different plan, then you're going to have to pay the difference. Okay. So yeah. they they'll pay the, the lowest. They take the state basic plan and it's paid for it. Yes. If they want to do it. Upgrade and they pay right. for it. Or if they want dental or if they want vision, they, they, you got to pay for all that. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else? A couple things we are working on and that I'm working on is a consolidation bill for uh, OSBI and the Bureau of Narcotics. And uh, working on behalf of the governor's office and doing that. And it's a, uh, an organic uh, consolidation. So we look at what, the, what can they do without losing their identity that's going to be involved. Um, there is a thought, and we've done it three times in the state of Oklahoma, taking up the uh, Bureau of Narcotics and put it underneath the SBI. Our drug problem gets all cured away, and then we get back in. We have to start establishing them all over again. So this bill is talking about we can really do IT services together. Uh, we can do training together, uh, do, and uh, even cross-train uh, the agents between the two. So if you've got a drug bust that's going on, and uh, there, there's a homicide that's found, and then your narcotics agents can deal with that homicide until OSBI gets there or some things. But our biggest savings will come in our regional offices. Uh, each one of those groups have regional offices in seven different towns across uh, Oklahoma and even with uh, the Highway Patrol. And so this bill will mandate uh, that they will be in the same office and uh, share office space. Uh, had breakfast yesterday morning with Mr. Rhodes of the uh, Department of Public Safety, and we're even using the uh, Highway Patrol Headquarters now in the Turnpike, that will have both OSBI and OBN officing out of some of the same areas. So I think we can save some money and do some things like that. It's organic, it's not going to disrupt some things uh, that's going on. So I think that's going to be very, very good for us as well. I do want to bring you up to date on a, just another point that is a, will be affecting us this next year, is that we have a 1115 waiver, uh, that's a Medicaid waiver that was given to us years and years and years ago. We're talking about the Kennedy administration. and. Uh, for some of you, that did back in the early 60s, and I've uh, been there. Uh, we remember those times, but over the last few years, that's been changing. The, uh, and uh, the auditing of how that money's being spent, our health care authority dropped the ball. And uh, whenever I talked to Senator Langford, uh, this is on us to begin with, and uh, keeping up with all the paperwork. Uh, the impact that it has is about $110 million a year to our teaching hospitals at OU and OSU in Tulsa. Because we did not meet their deadlines, we didn't do the paperwork that we should be doing, uh, we've lost that 110 million, and uh, it, they've already called back 31.7 million, and uh, so we had to do a supplemental the other day, uh, whatever money we have left, just to take care of that. So we're looking at about 110 million dollars. We're going to have to do something next year. Senator Langford, Congressman Mullen are working night and day trying to get that money back for us. 
and uh, to get requalified. But uh, you'll be hearing a little bit more about that, a little bit of the impact that's going to have on us uh, as we go forward. Yes, ma'am. Is there any good news coming out of the state capitol? Is there what? Any good news? It's closed. Out of the state it's closed today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not there. I'll tell you what, there is some good news, folks. Uh, you know, whenever we talk about where the economy's been over the last few years, uh, my first year, I believe we were about $600 million, uh, in the red. Uh, my second year up there, we were $1.3 billion in the red. And this year, we're about $160 million in the red. It's still red, but, I mean, we are gaining ground. Uh, we are doing some good things that's going forward, and, and, and I'm excited about that. Uh, we are being challenged at every area uh, of government because we have been playing catch up for so long. But the tide is turning for us to be able to address some problems that we're having <coughs> and go forward. Yes, ma'am. Is that because of the, what, the economy picking up, or is, is there other stuff going on? There, there's been some. Improved? Number one, the economy is picking up. But we were able to take the 1% wells uh, that were legacy wells in, in two different sessions and raise those to 7%. So that's kind of helped with it. The 1.25% one, uh, 1 tax on cars, that, that's helped with it, to be able to bring that back up. And so we've done a few things that's increased the revenue, but the economy is picking back up and, and uh, doing just a, a little bit better. Uh, we had estimated that, so whenever you see all the numbers coming in about how much we are ahead of budget, we had estimated that within the budget. And uh, the other thing too is people say, well, it looks like we're probably $125 million ahead. And uh, this year, keep in mind uh, that that's, we can't touch that money. And uh, until we start at <coughs> IT, we'll be able to start appropriating that and uh, we'll put some of that back into the rainy day fund uh, if we get over there. So I think there's some good things happening in the state. Uh, right now, uh, over this next year, the governor's race is going to get very interesting uh, as we move forward. Highly political year of all the got every house member up and half the Senate and the governor's and every statewide office. Uh, that's a pretty good one. Yes, sir. Uh, what's going on with the turnpike? Uh, in the last year, we've seen two rate increases on the turnpike. I was uh, I was through one of the toll gates uh, a couple weeks ago. The attendant said, "Put your money in the selfie." I said, "Can't you make change?" He said, "No, I'm not allowed to serve you until seven o'clock in the morning." He said, "They're working on a phase out of all employees, so all the stations are not going to be manned." And so that's. Something I'd like to see about. Uh, I'll tell you what I know about that. I'm not familiar with getting rid of all of the employees. I'll check on that. I know we're trying a pilot program on just tag readers, and I think that's up in the Tulsa area, uh, much like what uh, Texas is doing. I, I do know we've got a $900 million bond. Uh, the, the work is going from Bristow up to Tulsa, and then, of course, the uh, around Oklahoma City, trying to get some of the way down uh, downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, and how much they've raised those rates, I'll just have to check and, and get back with you. Well, it went from uh, the Dustin Tollgate was two dollars. Mm -hmm. It went up twenty-five cents last year. In January first, it went up to two fifty. Mm -hmm. And we have no authority over the turnpike. No, uh, I mean they are an autonomous body that basically a, a state subsidized business. No, no, actually they turn money back into the state uh, when it's, and it's all done. And uh, we, they have a percentage of the exi, uh, percentage of the gas tax that actually goes through them. They they lock, they book that throughout the year uh, for their bond rating. Then they turn that back to us toward the end of the state. And uh, they, if it were not for the Turnpike Authority, we would not have a Troopers Academy this year uh, because they were able to pay for that. Uh, we were not able to as a state. Did I miss any discussion on daylight savings time? I know it's going to be considered as your thoughts on that. Well, I had a I had a bill one time. I proposed to do away with the fiscal standard time. I got yeah. the heck beat out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit that. But there is another bill out there to just do the uh, daylight savings time year round. I, I don't think it would get very very far to run off with you because. The problem I had was people said, well, you know, we live close to Texas. A lot of people go back to Texas. We'll be in, you know, we won't be on the same time deal as Texas. So I, I don't see that <coughs> catching a whole lot of momentum, but there is one out there in the Senate, I believe. I don't think it's on the House. There's one in the Senate. Yeah. Some other good news coming out of the Capitol is uh, 
Representative Copeland and I just had a piece of bipartisan strawberry ice cream cake. So we split. I ate a salad. I ate a salad to do better. Actually, what happened was he looked at me and showed me the menu and said, "Get us one of these." Uh, I want to talk about economic development for just a moment. Um, it's it's kind of my lane that I I try to stay in at the Capitol. Uh, I was uh, awarded the o OEDC. Uh, Advocate of the Year for Economic Development in the State of Oklahoma, which uh, I was very proud to receive that as a freshman in the House. But Oklahoma, even with all our problems, with education and all the issues that we're, we're, we're struggling with, we are the Department of Commerce is receiving tons of requests for proposals in the State of Oklahoma for businesses that are wanting to come to our state and do business. Uh, one of the one of the struggles that we have is. We're surrounded by states that have what's called a uh, quick action closing fund, governor's quick, quick action closing fund. You've probably heard me talk about it or post about it maybe on Facebook. But. So basically it's, a, it's, a, it's an account that the governor has the opportunity to uh, utilize some funds to help recruit a business into the state in the upfront piece. I know that everybody hates incentives and all those things. But the reality of it is, is in order to compete um, with states around us for business, you have to have some incentives to bring to your state. You know, this this um, free market concept, it's it's not a reality. Uh, so I did run a bill, we got to pass through committee where we're actually going to take 5% of the, the uh, money that goes back to businesses through the quick action, uh, through the uh, quality jobs program. We're going to take 5% of that money and start to try to divert that back to uh, the governor's closing fund. Now, it will take three to five years to begin uh, seeing any revenues in there substantial enough to, um, uh, you know, utilize. But uh, it's a start. Uh, the Quick Action Closing Fund was started, I believe, in 2011. We funded it one time. Uh, I forget the dollar amount, but it's it's brought in substantial uh, amounts of investment in the state of Oklahoma. So we do have a lot of activity, um, and, and it's all highly confidential, as the mayor knows. Economic development is highly confidential when companies are looking at your area. But I just want you to know there are a lot of opportunities coming to Oklahoma. I work really hard with the Department of Commerce, so we're always in the forefront of their mind. We have some potential opportunities that could come to Oklahoma County if selected. But uh, so there are some good things in light of all the bad things that go on at the Capitol. Uh, people do want to come to Oklahoma and do business. And if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, till we bring low wage earners in Oklahoma in our rural areas back to a middle wage status through economic development, we will never fix our problem. And so, you know, there, there, there are a lot of companies that are looking, some very big companies looking at Oklahoma right now. Yes, sir. Representative, at the same time you're talking about financing, do you also hear them discussing the Oklahoma workforce? As far as? Suitable workforce, qualified workforce. Absolutely. Workforce. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge topic. And one of the great things we have in Omaha County is OSUIT. Plus, we have Green Country Technology Center. In fact, one of the requests for proposals that um, the reason we would potentially have a, the best shot at it, uh, first of all, they've already said Oklahoma is their primary target. There's one other state. But the reason why we could potentially have this project come to our county is because of OSUIT and what they could offer this this uh, particular group. So, so, but yeah, I mean, workforce is a, is a huge issue. The great thing about where we're located is Tulsa has grown so far south now that we are in that radius that companies look at to say, do I have substantial workforce, trained workforce? But yes, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a big issue with companies. Any other questions? Uh, question, I attended a uh, reception for a new company in Oklahoma City. I moved here from California. They came here with other engineers. And uh, between Boeing and uh, this is a large drum company, uh, they'll take every engineer we turn out. And so the tax climate was good, our engineers was great, and uh, so they are the 310, 340 employees already uh, in the city. 
And agriculture used to be our number two uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, aeronautics is now our number two generator uh, in Oklahoma. And as far as our economic development. So oil and gas still number one, and then the uh, aeronautics industry is number two. I dispute those numbers, but that's all right. You can say that all the time. Agriculture is still number two. The other, the other thing to kind of bounce off of that is when you when you talk about aerospace and the engineering tax credits um, that that Oklahoma has, we extended those eight years. I ran that through the house last year. We we have missed the opportunity for three or two and potentially a third uh, electric car manufacturer that would come to potentially come to the state of Oklahoma. So we're looking at. Uh, Myself and House Leadership are looking at potentially replicating the aerospace engineer tax credit to an auto engineer tax credit um, because we've lost we've lost the opportunity probably for about two thousand jobs in the last twelve months for auto industry uh, manufacturers that would potentially want to come to Oklahoma. So we're trying to figure out how to become a little more competitive. The great thing about the auto industry is if you get one, you typically get two. And then it, it starts other businesses around them as far as distribution of those types of things. So, so we're really going to try to try to fix our situation where we become more competitive with a, with an auto engineering tax credit. And kind of following up on that, we got the Tesla who wanted to come into Oklahoma, and uh, we had a bill over the Senate side to address that. Not personally, I was against. It. And uh, the reason I'm against it is they don't want to have a dealership, they don't want to have a distributorship, they simply want to sell directly uh, in Oklahoma. I don't think it protects your people that way. But you also take every car dealership that we have in the state and uh, it can have a dramatic effect on the economic development that we already have. So you need to be very, very careful uh, whenever we start looking at some of these companies that want to come in and exactly what impact is it going to have on us, is it going to be a benefit to the state, or is it going to be a negative to the state. And so we did have that bill in, in the Senate. Uh, for that, for the direct sales of Tesla, and uh, I was uh, no on it until they come up with a political plan. I'm probably going to serve the people of Oklahoma. I agree with the senator on that. They're supposed to bring fifty million dollars. No. <laughs> Talking about that though, like I've got a lot of kickback, and I'm sure y'all have heard it too about Quick Trip coming in because we worked so hard to get them. About the small businesses on Main Street are going to be damaged by them. When they did the traffic impact analysis, they showed us that 50,000 people cross that intersection every day. We're not pulling a tenth off of the highway. If Quick Trip is sitting there, they're going to pull from the highway more than they're going to pull from our city. And they showed it that to us as part of getting where we were today. But, you know, we've had lots, there was lots of discussion on the chamber about how we were going to ruin every one of the small businesses here. And that wasn't the intention at all. It was to pull more people off the highway to increase our tax base. And that's what they're trying to do. You're not pulling shows. any I 40 traffic on. None. And, and I mean, maybe a few that yeah. accidentally get off, they but they go. don't see Henry right. yet. Right. But Quick Trip will have big signs up on I 40 and you'll begin to pull. And we don't pull any semi Which was part of the problem we had trying to get the deal done yeah. was, you know, the, the traffic coming off of I 40 and the, and, and the, and the access. Impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Never, I agree. I, I get my gas at Love's. If a quick trip comes in, I'm still going to get my gas at Love's. I'm not going to drive all the way down here and go across there. Well, I always went there. I'm not going to switch that up. Well, they did a study that showed that if you have a routine, you typically stay in your routine okay. anyway, and that you don't change. When it's new, you're going to go check it out. Yeah. You're going to go see what they have. You're going to go look at it. Yeah. But then you're going to go back to your routine. If you leave home and you get coffee at wherever, if loves, per well, se. we got about 10 minutes. I want to deal with one more issue. And uh, I'm surprised I went into Oklahoma today. There's a bill that's in the Senate side that is basically mandating back into the classrooms. First of all, we don't give enough money to the school now that somehow we want to mandate what teachers put in their classrooms. That will have the national motto of In God We Trust. It'll have the U.S. flag, Oklahoma flag, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution in every classroom in America and uh, I are in Oklahoma and go that direction. Uh, first of all, I debate against that idea of the I that we're mandating what a teacher puts in their classroom. Uh, I think that would belong to them. I'm not sure how putting the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence in every kindergarten is really going to help us. But my debate is not centered upon so much of that 
it was centered upon placing the words in God we trust in the classroom. Today we have 120 languages in our public schools. We have a multitude of religions in Oklahoma anymore. Now, if I got that outside the building, I don't mind supporting that, and I've got my child with me, and he says, Dad, what's that mean up there? As a parent, I can explain what that means. But if it's inside that classroom, and you've got a Christian teacher who's teaching that, to whether it be Muslims or whatever we have, and when I said we've got 120 languages, that teacher's now into a spot. What does that mean? Answering that question. And, and so whenever I asked the senator who was running that yesterday, that same question, he said, well, that teacher could basically say that, well, it means different things to different people. So in a follow-up question, I said, you know, in the Romans, kind of polytheistic time, where there's many gods, but the Bible says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. And so if you sit there and tell that child, and you look at the word God, and you say it means different things to different people, are you standing for your God or not for your God? You got a classroom teacher that we're putting on the spot to be able to do that. I said, let's turn it around. If we have a Muslim teacher that's in that classroom, and we do have some, and it says, in God we trust, and your child asks, what does that mean? And they begin to explain, that means Allah. And this is the way you worship Allah. As a parent, whenever you come, your child comes home that night, how are you going to feel about it? And you can add some other type of religions in that as well. And so I don't know where that's going to go. It did pass out a committee. You're going to hear more of it on the floor. Uh, but I wanted you to be aware, that's kind of where I am on it. Uh, I'll be the first one to say I've got a firm faith in God. I've got a firm belief in God. I follow God all the way down. But if you want to put our teachers into a situation, not only lawsuits, but our parents climbing up their backside on a regular basis, I think this is the first step to be able to get it done. Now, whether you agree with that or disagree, I'm very interested in your thoughts about that. I think if you were to utilize that as a, as a history opportunity, to just teach facts about history, how this nation was founded, and the foundation of the Constitution and of these rules on it, and keep it at that. I think one of them might be okay with just that. But uh, when you do have different interpretations, I wouldn't get into that. But, uh, and that may lead, uh, lead you into it. But teaching history of the founding of the nation, mm -hmm. and the commonality of, of the founders, mm -hmm. uh, I think is extremely important. I think it's called school now. I mean, sure. I think it's not, uh, uh, it could open up a couple of months, possibly. Sure. My, my thought on that, Roy, and I. I made the argument on the Ten Commandments as well. You and I die, we stand before God in heaven, and we say God was able to get the Ten Commandments on the courthouse yard, and was able to get them at the Capitol up there, but we couldn't tell people they were from you. There, we, we got them there, but we had to say it's part of our history or it's something else. We can never say that these were actually ordained from God and that's God's Ten Commandments, which I believe they are. That's being there. Are we not deceiving ourselves and other people from my religious point of view, to say, all that in God we trust, folks, all that means is that's our national motto. That's all it means to me. Well, for me personally, that's not what that means to me. It means in God I trust. Period. Yes? If, if you go back to the founding fathers, in their philosophy, it was not a freedom of religion, but it was a freedom of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would look at what the original ideals was of the founding fathers to, to guide them. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you say, if I if I take in God we trust out of, out of the classroom to protect the, tree, the teachers, uh, because you want them to say, well, I'm going to force you not to, I'm going to force you to deny God before men. So if we take the classroom, it's not doing the same thing with others. That's just semantics. Yeah. 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 So the real thing, you know, I would point out, most of the founders, many of the founding fathers were deists. Two, when you get to the very first amendment of the Constitution, you know, we shall not establish any religion. I mean, right. we were, many of the founding fathers were oppressed by the church and people <clears throat> did not like the fact that they were forced to. So I, I, although I think most of us, if not all of us in this room are Christians, I do think that's an important principle to remember. And I certainly agree with what you're saying. There are many games played over in that building, I'm going to tell you. That, that bill has less to do with putting in God we trust in the classroom than putting something on, on the board that you vote on 
and you vote the way that they can put a, a little pamphlet out in November that says you voted against putting in God we trust in the classroom so they can get some election won or lost because of that. If you want to know the fact, that's what that bill is for. It has nothing to do with what you really, it should be. It's all about politics. And I talked about that this morning. The political games that's played in that building will drive you nuts. And that's one of them. And, and what evidence of that? Dude, that's what frustrates us sitting over here. Well, that's what we frustrates want, we me. Want, we want stuff done. We don't care if this daylight savings time is fast or not. We want a budget passed. Yep. We want our school teachers taken care of. We want those kind of things done that not not being God we trust or you have. <coughs> or some abortion. Hey, oh, should I stand for <laughs> <laughs> I told, I told the group this morning, my frustration is coming out after 10 years, and I see how these games are played, and the bills that are run in real purposes for them. And they're for, they're for the next election. They're not for the good of Oklahoma. So an interesting story developed in the House yesterday. We have a representative who has voted against every revenue measure that has been put on the board all year long. Okay. He not is. Me. Uh, no. Not me. Wasn't you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just, you mean uh, no? just for clarification here. So he um, he is in committee yesterday. Files a bill to raise the gross production tax to put it on the ballot to raise the gross production tax to vote of the people. And he has two of his buddies do it, kill the bill. <laughs> kill the bill in committee. They did a do not pass, which is actually pretty good, pretty aggressive, right? You're in committee. So, so you rarely see a do not pass in a committee. So he has them kill the bill. Guess what? He just got an opponent in the last couple of weeks. So now he gets to go back to his district and say, I vote, I ran a bill to raise that gross production tax. But he had his buddies kill him. And that stuff goes on. Not with any of us, but before. You know, to, to answer you, we, we don't address the budget. I don't want you guys to leave here. Uh, we passed a lot of things out of finance that we're looking at. Uh, some of it is on our capital gains. And uh, the Incentive Review Commission looks at that. And uh, we are spending in Oklahoma today around about $120 million a year uh, on capital gains incentives. It brings in $9 million a year to the state of Oklahoma. And so again, you go back to a business principle, uh, principle if you're spending $9 million a year uh, for 100, uh, losing 120, you need to get out of that business. And that's passed out of finance, passed out of corporations, we'll be on the floor uh, where that comes in. So there, uh, and that's quite a bit of money we get back in the budget to begin to close up some of the gaps that are out there. Yesterday we passed, uh, cap coal credits and uh, we'll also I'll be able to cap the railroad credits uh, that are out there so we know what our budget's going to be. Uh, our bill passed out as a corporation just on some of the wind credits. Uh, we'll start bringing that back in. All those are 51% votes and so we begin to build up the money that we need to go back and then begin to give the teachers raises and take care of some of the other at, at issues. Uh, these nutcase bills get caught up in, in the news and the media but there's a lot of work that's going on. How many people Applying and publishing current house for more revenue. <laughs> what? Yeah. Have you thought about have you thought about enrolling and publishing clearing house for more revenue? Yeah. yeah. We're actually coming close, but we got so much backlog uh, that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we've got to do a fourteen million dollar supplemental for the Department of Corrections before uh, the fiscal year ends, uh, simply because of where we are there. And uh, uh, we've got that we must address that. I've said that for three years, but we're getting absolutely critical. Uh, in Calister today because the age of the facility that's down there is double the price of inmates in Calister. Uh, just, uh, just to take care of which is about $38,000 a year per inmate. And we're running about at seventeen dollars to $20,000 uh, on an average. So I mean that's just one area. Rural health is another area. And, uh, but we're, we're getting there. We're making a little bit of progress. And I know that our time has is, is expired. And yeah, we have a good yeah, two minutes. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you all. Has anybody here ever gotten any money out of the unclaimed property fund? I applied because 
the nursing home was on there four times and I never heard a word back from them. Well, I sent everything they wanted and I never heard back from them. One of the bills we passed, and I you know, passed consent to, yes. to fill in a hole of the money that was supplanted from the lottery money was using more unclaimed property. And we use $35, $40 million of that every year since I've been there. And a lot of money gets brought into it. But I didn't find out until yesterday that there's no limit as to the amount of money that you could use out there. There's no statutory limit that says you can't go below any level or anything else. So we have gotten to the point where we kind of use that claim property fund as another rainy day fund. And when we need money, we just go sweep a little out of the unclaimed property fund. Yes, ma'am. I got money for it for a client out of that. So it does happen sometimes. I do want to make one quick announcement. Um, I've been working with the uh, food bank and uh, uh, the DAB and uh, March 31st, 30. March 30th, here in Henrietta, we are going to have a veterans food drive, yeah. food bank drive, food drive, what, food bank. Um, and it will be kept for the, for the entire county, but it'll be down here at the Methodist Church. Uh, if you reach out to the mayor, if you'd like to help with that or have some you know, some people in an organization that may want to help. You know, we, we plan on passing out 15,000 pounds of food that day. So, and, uh, to any veteran, it doesn't matter your income level or anything like that. If you're a veteran, you, you get a you get a voucher and um, come down there and fill your, fill your trunk up with some food. And then so, it revolves every 90 days thereafter. Yeah, and it, that's correct. We'll, we will continue that program for, for every 90 days. Any other questions? If you have them, we'll talk to you afterwards. All right.